Um, hey, Kate and Lynn, can you guys hear me? Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, there we go. Can you hear yeah. my work now? Yep, I can do it. So, yep. Um, all right, great. Um, so, friends, uh, we have um, Kate Davenport and uh, Lynn Hoffman from Eureka Recycling. Mm -hmm. They're both co presidents. Um, is it a women owned business, um, Kate? It's women led. We're a, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. So, um, but we are the yep, women led co presidency. And a woman uh, is our board chair. Well, got a lot right, of ladies. That, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't let you finish. Mm, that's okay. All right, great, great. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, um, actually, um, in, in the global dialogue on waste, um, out of the um, 15 speakers we have, nine of them are women, um, and um, this is something that we've been trying from the very beginning with Waste Wise, which is have um, diverse voices. Uh, not just uh, you know based on um, gender, but also based on uh, you know uh, class and um, region. And um, we believe you know having that kind of diversity is one of the best um, insurances for us for, on on the long term. Um, so uh, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, as you know, uh, most of uh, the people who are joining today's chat know, um, Eureka Recycling is a nonprofit organization uh, working from um, uh, working in the state of Minnesota. And um, they are one of the very few nonprofit organizations who are actually providing services um, um, like waste management services and, you know, sorry, recycling services. And um, we also have Kate Bailey, who works with EcoCycle. Um, she'll be talking um, tomorrow. And um, they also operate a nonprofit organization which provides services. Um, Kate and Lynn, um, do either one of you want to talk about this nonprofit organizations providing services? In the U.S., um, how does that work? Sure. Yeah, there are really there's only a handful of us left. I think there are five or six that we know of. Um, you know, I think recycling really the origin stories are in nonprofits and community grassroots efforts. Um, there there are a few of us left. I, th I think because of the challenges of um, the challenges of operations and competing um, when the majority of the other players in the market are are integrated with larger um, waste hauling services and have um, deeper pockets and kind of different different missions. Um, and there's that, and then there's also you know some challenge with the tension between being a service provider and being an advocacy organization, um, and how those you know those roles can. Um, we think it's a really healthy and interesting tension, but it doesn't mean it's always comfortable. Um, so there you know there are kind of the there have been nonprofits that many that have let go or sold the operations and just kept the advocacy role. Um, and we can certainly understand it. We've asked that question very um, concretely a few times in our history, if it was time to, to do that. But we find a lot of power in this model in really being where the rubber meets the road and having the boots on the ground. So we, it finds, um, it gives us a little bit more um, credibility as an advocacy organization because we're in it and we're doing it. We can talk about the challenges of paying living wage with full-time employees in the MRF when we have fluctuating volumes of material. How does that work? Not easy, but you know, it's something so we can be really transparent about it and speak from a place of knowing. Um, is there anything you want to add to that? No, I think that's You'll probably hear it weaved in and out throughout the rest of the conversation. Mm -hmm. the, well, maybe the last thing I would say is I just think that there's a reality that as a nonprofit, and you could hear this come up in Chaz and Cole's conversation, but you know, legally, we don't have to primarily focus on shareholder return. Uh, we can balance profitability with other um, values such as highest and best use of the material that we recycle or paying living wages. And that, that I think it's really important to emphasize <clears throat> that that's, that's a legal difference between a for-profit and a non-profit. Um, and so I just think that makes the, how we make decisions is very different. And I think we tend to probably have a longer term perspective than particularly a multinational that's, that's really aiming to maximize shareholder return on a quarterly basis. Right, I think I, I think that's great. I mean, uh, Be Waste Wise is a nonprofit, and you know we invest. Um, we look at Be Waste Wise as a way to invest our time and um, uh, money 
in something that uh, lasts longer than a quarter. Um, and we see this as you know one of the best ways to um, have long-term impact. And um, it's also, I feel, is like parental care. You know, in parental care, you don't get a um, IRR in the next um, quarter or so. So <laughs> even after 20 years, you might not get any return that could be valued by GDP. So um, we look at it in that way. And but um, but when it comes to the finances, I think you've done much better than B Waste Wise. And I believe that's also really important because um, you know there is a saying in India in in Bollywood um, movies where you know you're supposed to be like a candle which gives light to the world, but then you're you know you know slowly melting away. But then <laughs> that's that's been most nonprofits over the time. But I think uh, when it comes to you, you're more like the sun. You know, you can sustain yourself for a longer time and then give that light, you know, to more people. So that, that's really interesting. Could you talk to me about, um, you know, the, the financing or um, talk to me about the money? Um, yeah. How do you keep yourself going? <laughs> yeah, I think I can start with that. I think, um, you know, one thing I just want to highlight before we get into the nitty gritty of how our financial model works is that we are financially sustainable. So the model that we have is not being subsidized uh, by grants or or other methods. Like we're, we're trying to run a demonstration that's operating in the same marketplace um, that any for-profit is operating in, and that has value in terms of our demonstration as well. You know, if we're going to push the industry in certain directions, if we're operating in that same financial paradigm, that that has more power. Mm -hmm. um, since our inception. Um, I think the financial model has been really based around how do we how do we um, build local and regional markets around recycling and bring those stakeholders together. Um, and that's that model is what we've used to finance our capital needs. So when we um, bought the trucks in 2003 um, and then opened the MRF uh, in 2004, it was originally a dual stream MRF in 2004. Um, you know, we went out to the market in terms of the end markets. We went to the paper markets and said, hey, we're going to open a facility here. Would you be willing to invest, you know, lend us money for the capital investments in exchange? We'll give you a supply agreement. We've done that about three or four times in our history. Um, and so, you know, at this point in time, although we've been impacted by price in terms of the national sword, et cetera, we haven't been impacted by movement in the same way, and that's because of those supply chain relationships. Um, and so that has kind of been the backbone in a lot of ways of our financial model is building those supply chain relationships, both for capital investment, but also for movement of material. And the reason that those, you know, end markets are willing to invest that capital is one, that guarantee of supply, but also because of who we are and our commitment to environmental highest and best use, we've had good quality material. We've had that reputation for 15 years. And so it's all of those things coming together that has made the financial model work. So, you know, we do debt financing like anybody else. We pay interest rates and all of that to purchase all the equipment that we have here. Um, and we've done a, about three rounds of significant capital investment over the years, both for trucks, collection trucks, as well as for um, the facility. We have two primary business units. Uh, one is collection. So we have contracts with cities um, to collect recycling, the city of St. Paul, as well as some other smaller suburbs in the metro area. And that's um, that's a set rate per household every month. So it's a, a steady income stream coming in. Um, and then we have the processing side of things where we're sorting recyclables at the MRF or the material recovery facility. And we have a mix of private relationships and municipal relationships for sorting that material. Um, and we use a revenue share model. So we take the sale of the materials that we, you know, that we sort and then sell those materials into the commodities market. Um, and we share that revenue with our customers after the deduction of a processing fee. So that means both parties are taking part in the volatility of the market and we're, we're covering our baseline cost of processing um, to a certain degree. And, and I heard Chaz talk about this before. That's again, having, including municipalities kind of share in the risk and reward of being in a commodities market. Um, I think maybe I would just circle back to the, to the nonprofit model um, to Kate's 
to Kate's point, that our business units are self-sustaining. So we're a strange nonprofit, and then we're about 97, 98% fee for service. But we do, we do um, go after grants, and we get we get individual donations and work with foundations, and but we are very clear about how we're using that money. It's you know what we think about it like this is this uh, model that we're trying to to show, but if the forest falls in the tree and nobody hears it, right? So how do we use these grants and donations to leverage this model that we have towards systems change? So engaging our local community around education and um, other zero waste initiatives, but then also how do we how do we package up and and use this model that we have towards policy change and pushing the industry? So that's how, where our nonprofit status really um, comes into play. Right. Um, uh, well, um, w one very important aspect of um, your uh, services or your operations is um, education, uh, the very strong community education part of it. Um, but um, before we talk more about it. Um, you know, one of the reasons um, we invited uh, both of you um, was because um, because of the changes that are happening um, in the recycling markets now in the U.S. Um, we felt that you know local markets might be a very good opportunity for many people, and many people in the U.S. and Europe are looking for ways to develop those uh, local markets. So um, before we talk more about the um, subject. Could you um, tell us a little bit about um, how much of your um, recyclables are within the state limits or within your the regional limits? And um, how, how did you how did you develop those markets? Could you talk to us about single, you know, any big large clients that you have? And uh, before yeah. we talk about that, um, I'll just remind everyone that. Um, uh, we're already uh, 15 minutes um, through uh, time with Kate and um, Lynn. And uh, something that I've always observed is once you start ta talking about you know waste management, um, time really flies really fast. So um, if you have any questions, don't wait until the last minute to ask. Uh, put your questions in the live chat window um, below the video stream. Um, so Kate or Lynn, you know, one of you. Sure, I can. So yeah, I think you're, the first part of that question was, kind of um, how much of our, where our material goes in terms of the material we sort. So um, about 85% of our material stays within the state of Minnesota actually. Um, and then about 90% within the Midwest region. Um, and then 100% of our material stays within North America. Uh, we do sell some material, not a whole lot to Canada and Mexico. Um, but the, again, the majority of our material is sold in the state of Minnesota. Um, that, you know, a large percentage of our material, number one is glass, uh, is about 20% of our material, and that goes to a glass beneficiating facility or sorting facility here in the Twin Cities metropolitan area. Um, and Eureka has actually been really instrumental in bringing glass markets to the state of Minnesota and keeping them here. Um, and so we can talk more about that. And then most of our paper stays here in the state of Minnesota as well. Um, actually, in the Twin Cities metropolitan area. So there's a West Rock paper mill about five mil miles from us. Um, and this goes back to our how we've done financing over the years. But when we converted to single stream, um, the West Rock Corporation, uh, which was Rock 10 at the time, um, and helped us with capital financing um, for the single stream conversion. Um, and then we did a supply agreement, a long-term supply agreement, actually. Um, and so that both helped us get the capital. It helped them get a guarantee of good quality, both news, mixed paper, and OCC for cardboard. Um, so the majority of our paper, which is about half of our material that comes in through the facility, goes to that West Rock Mill. Not all of our paper. Uh, we're not, you know, we want to be smart. We don't want to have all of our eggs in one basket. <laughs> Um, but most of that material. And then we have plastics markets here in the state of Minnesota, um, mostly for our HDPE. A lot of that stays in the in the state. Um, our, a lot, our PET, we don't have a processor here in, in Minnesota, but we do have some in the Midwest. So um, we've entered into supply relationships also with some of the plastics markets. Um, so that kind of gives a profile of where our material stays. And I want to highlight something really important here, which is um, you know, it's easy for us to maybe stand up and pound our chest about how we had we have such good local markets, and that is a result of our 
uh, kind of commitment to local markets from a regional economic development perspective. Um, but we also are in the Midwest, and that's a different dynamic than, for example, on the coasts. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, part of our ability to have those local markets is just a result of geography. It's a combination of geography and our business model. Um, so since, since we're talking about that, can I ask you a follow-up question? This is something that we've discussed earlier, which is um, for, for others, um, other change makers um, in the U.S. who, are trying to, um, who might want to do what you're doing, um, is uh, how, how much of an influence or impact does um, the local regulations or local governance or local policy have on your success and your continued, um, you know, uh, on, on your continued success? So um, could, could you talk about that? I mean, you mentioned that, you know, Midwest has these um, local and regional markets, but also um, how about the regulations or, you know, the leaders that are, uh, that are here? And um, before you answer that, let me just remind um, everyone um, that um, I'm, my name is Ranjit Anipu. I'm a co-founder of Be Waste Wise. And we're talking to Kate Davenport and Lynn Hoffman from Eureka Recycling. And um, Be Waste Wise has organized a um, number of um, webinars um, um, on, the way, on the issue of waste in 2013. Um, in the first year, we organized eight events, and now in 20, um, this year, we've organized um, more than uh, 35 events. Um, and next year, that, that's almost one and a half events a week. And next year, we are trying to get closer to one event a week, which will make us one of the largest video platforms um, for you know sharing knowledge. So if you're an organization with expertise, uh, if you have uh, the solutions that can help the world, you know, reach out, uh, reach out to us. We are a nonprofit, and let's work together, you know, to share this expertise with everyone. So Kate or Lynn, um, please. Yeah. Sure, I think. Um... So your question about kind of the, the influence of local municipalities and, and governing bodies and regulations and how they influence our business model and our ability to do what we do. Um, the first thing that came to mind is that, you know, in the 15 plus years that we've been in this marketplace, we've seen some real changes in the way that cities are structuring their RFPs and their contracts for the better. So we're seeing more and more cities actually have requirements or um, extra points for, you know, um, um, prioritizing local markets or transparency around markets, and um, being able to to um, accurately report on where materials kind of next life. Right? So not just that you that a broker sold it somewhere and it's recycled, but what where did it go? What was the impact? And how did what did it get turned into? Um, so we're seeing more and more cities uh, build that into the structure of contracts, which I think is really helpful and not only um, in just m moving the marketplace and the industry in general. And then the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency here also has some regulations that, I, that are helpful um, around, you know, it's uh, about not landfilling, anything collected as recycling, unless the commissioner is given a specific um, variance or permit um, and then you know things like uh, beneficial use like um, using glass as landfill cover isn't considered recycling in Minnesota by virtue of the um, regulations and so um, I think that certainly helps make some of those decisions easier I, I don't know if you have other yeah I say on the on the flip side of that I think Minnesota um, well, I'd say one more thing. I think there's been a real commitment to recycling for yes. many years. And yes. so there's been investments by multiple stakeholders, counties, cities, in education. So I think Minnesota in general has one of the lower, if not lowest, residual rates um, compared to other parts of the country where you might see 20 to 30 percent residual. The average here is more around 7 to 10 percent, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty low. And I think that is a reflection of the whole, all of the stakeholders mm -hmm. engaging in that. I think, I will say, I think Eureka has set the bar around some of that, mm -hmm. um, which is our goal is to demonstrate and set mm -hmm. that bar. Um, Maybe can I add to that there, there is a, um, a state recycling goal, not quite as aggressive probably as California's, and it came up in the conversation earlier. Um, I think our feeling is those goals are, are very helpful, but and just need to be shored up by regulations that help ensure that our measures don't get mistaken for our goals, right? So just moving it from the trash can to the recycling bin, I think over time, our, our 
our vision kind of stops there and we consider that success. And I think that's part of why we're in the, the space that we're in right now as an industry. You know, if you can put it in the blue bin and somebody somewhere will take it, then we'll check that box. And I think um, we lose sight of why we started recycling in the first place. And the, you know, there are times when recycling isn't the right answer. More recycling isn't better unless it equates to less trash and more local jobs and cleaner air and cleaner water and all those things, right? So when Kate was talking about where we market, you know, we, we have marketed materials outside of North America in the past. We're not fundamentally against that. Um, it's just that as a social enterprise, when you're weighing the environmental impact of shipping something that far, and we are lucky to have local markets available, that when you're, when you're balancing all of those things, shipping it around the world doesn't always um, come up with the best equation. And I, I'll just add that one thing to that, Randy. I think one of the examples we saw is we, like many parts of the country, saw a real push towards adding all plastics one through seven to the yeah. program, uh, to programs about five to seven years ago. Yep. Um, cities got really pushed by the state and county to add that to meet those recycling goals. Um, and, and that's to Lynn's point, the question that wasn't totally asked there was, do those all those plastics have markets? What is that material getting turned into? Um, and we were we were pretty vocal at the time that we were not going to want to accept one through sevens because we knew that there weren't markets really for that three through seven bale. That really what people wanted out of the three through seven bale was the polypropylene. And so we added tubs and lids or yogurt tubs to our program, but not plastics three through seven because of that commitment to really our wanting to make sure that when you add a material, it really is getting recycled. And I think that that's an example of many places of experience that where the the push to meet the goal of tons collected at the curb had us lose sight of really why we're trying to recycle in the first place. Right, um, that makes sense. And um, so let me ask you a um, question about um, this is something that you've mentioned, you know, um, as an advocacy, the, the dual roles you play as an advocacy organization and also as someone who implements uh, being a service provider. So um, when you say that you're accepting only certain types of materials, that means that their re remaining are going to uh, less beneficial use or, um, or less beneficial method of treating or, you know, disposing them. So. Um, how do you deal with that? And before you answer that question, we have a, um, a question asking if the webinars are recorded for uh, to be later. Um, yes, they're all recorded and they'll all be available for free um, after the uh, webinar, the recording's done. Um, so yeah, um, Carolyn, uh, go for it. Um, I mean, I guess we would argue that it's not necessarily a less beneficial use because if, if you're collecting something as recyclable, that's really not, it's just taking a, a longer trip to get to the incinerator or the landfill. Um, so really for us, it's about transparency, you know, and we spoke a little bit about education. There's part of the reason that some communities add all plastics, I think, is because we could print a phone book of, you know, guides to recycling every year, um, just to help people navigate what is and isn't, what goes in the cart, how to prepare it. But the reality is we have about 20 seconds, if that, of people's attention and we're competing with a lot of other things in people's lives. And so you got to, um, so I think some of that push was to make it easier. Just put it all in, we'll sort it out and we'll figure it out. I think the problem then is that that takes off any pressure from the um, consumption, behavior change or consumption change and any pressure from the producers of those materials because now they're recyclable so they're the preferred option to buy at the store. You don't feel bad about buying as much as you want because it's getting recycled and doing something good, right? So it um, really changes the way that people think about that product, and which is, I think, why we've really tried to hold the line on accepting materials that we know aren't really going to be recycled or we know recycling isn't really the best path for those materials. Um, so let's see, I can't remember where I was going with that exactly. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Like it, yeah. It does. Um, so uh, let me um, put another question to you. So um, can you give some tips to people who might want to do something like this, but are in states or in regions where the local laws or leadership are uh, n not as you know friendly as they are to you, uh, to your uh, operations? So um, could you give them some tips on how they could 
um, developed markets and how they could uh, make sure that they, they were successful, you know, make money to be able to um, fund themselves. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest tip I would give is to say, you know, people have asked us many times, are you going to, are you going to go spread Eureka? Are you going to go start Eureka in the rest of the 49 states? Um, and, you know, I think the reality is, is that state, you know, waste in the United States is very local in terms of how it's regulated. Mm -hmm. And each state is very different in terms of who the policymakers are, where the decisions are made. Um, and so the first thing I would say is really understand the policy um, environment for your state. You know, for example, Minnesota, you know, the counties have a lot of regulatory power over waste and then the and then they distribute monies to the cities for recycling programs or composting programs. But that's not necessarily the case everywhere. And so you really have to understand what's the policy environment um, and how is that set up and who are the decision makers and who does contracts and, and those kinds of things. Um, so to me, that would be the first piece. The other piece is to say, are there market, are there paper mills and plastics recyclers in your state or in neighboring states and build relationships with them? Um, I think one of the, you know, one of the realities of recycling and it being a global commodity and particularly that the multinationals that are in the waste and recycling industry, right, they have huge supply of material. And so you've seen them be very adverse to going into local or regional supply agreements because then they lose their ability to play the market on a global level. And so, um, whereas I think those of us that are smaller don't have A, that same kind of supply in the marketplace and power, but at the flip side, are they thus more willing to enter into supply agreements with regional mills? And so go talk to the regional mills. I mean, I was just talking to somebody the other day that's in another Midwestern state that said, the regional mills are saying they don't have enough supply. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a breakdown of, you know, that that's the market not connecting and making those supply chain relationships. So find those mills, talk to them, um, see what they want, how much supply they want. Um, and, and, you know, in Minnesota, we have had a, a state agency that has been willing to help in terms of market development. Um, go to your state agencies, and not just the Pollution Control Agency. I mean, Lynn mentioned this before. Go to your Department of Economic Development. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all, you know, the numbers are are pretty, you know, widely recognized that taking a ton of recycling, a ton of waste and putting it in the recycling train, supply chain is going to create 10 plus more jobs, whereas taking it to the landfill or the incinerator is maybe one or two jobs. So that would be my other recommendation is find those mills and look at what the kind of regional economic development benefits are, because you could potentially get dollars from that in terms of investment. Um, but having guaranteed supply of incoming material and outgoing material, I think has been really important to our model. Mm -hmm. Maybe the last thing I would add is that, you know, we obviously are huge advocates of the social enterprise approach, whether or not you incorporate as a B Corp or a nonprofit, or there's a lot of ways to do it. But I think, um, you know, it, even if the, regulatory systems aren't there in the community you're in yet. I think we know that municipalities take a while to catch up to the values of the community. And so I think, you know, we've really seen our community get energized and excited about living, you know, things that we offer because of our social enterprise model, like living wage and local markets and those pieces that are, um, that are important. And people, you know, people recycle because it's a concrete thing that they can do every day that benefits their community. And, you know, I think people are hungry for that right now. And so the more that you can um, infuse the values of the community into the way that you're doing it, not just that you're doing it, but like how are the people being treated that are doing that work? You know, I think that that is the path forward for, for everyone, I think is really um, finding the intersections and in all of those values. The, the last thing I'll add to I think is, you know, we're hearing a lot I think there's a lot of conversation across the country about a labor shortage, about automation and digitalization and how yeah. that's affecting the workforce. And so, you know, we're in conversations around the recycling industry, but we're also in conversations around workforce development and how do you, you know, how do you pay living wage? All of our sorters are full-time Eureka employees with benefits and paid sick time and paid time off. That's not typical in the recycling industry. Um, and so, and at the same time, you know, we, like many other industries, are having a hard time finding enough drivers, finding enough maintenance folks. 
So we're sitting down with community colleges trying to say, how do we create workforce pipelines? That's that trying to understand how recycling is not just about recycling the paper. It, it's about regional economic development and benefit to the community. Um, I know that's a um, topic that Cole's been working on. Cole Rosengren from Ways 5 has been working on for quite a while. Something that uh, he's been really interested in, in the workforce and in the automation um, discussion. Um, next, we'll talk about um, recycling technology and specifically we'll talk about sales stream. Uh, but before that, friends, my name is Ranjit Anipu. I'm a senior waste management consultant. I'm also co-founder of Be Waste Wise. And um, today we're talking to uh, Kate Brownport and Lynn Hoffman from Eureka Recycling um, as part of the 2018 Global Dialogue on Waste. So if you have any questions, um, use the live chat um, window below the video stream and then send it, um, post your questions and comments to us. Um, so uh, we have um, two comments and um, I think if you can talk about this as um, continuing our discussion um, from you know what Chaz and Cole spoke about um, before you and and the comments are that um, you know single stream is uh, good in principle but the current technologies are woefully behind and intentions may have been good but in practice contamination rates are astronomical so um, do you have any thoughts on you know these comments yeah I mean I, I think Single st there's a lot to pull apart there. There are a lot of factors that impact how a single stream program performs. Um, everything from collection methods to compaction to you know what is accepted material and what isn't. Um, and then of course how 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 are you running the facility? How are you? Um, I, I always want a shortcut to how fast are you running the lines, but that's not necessarily speed is one obviously um, one indicator. But those, so there are a lot of different elements to a program. I think um, that you know, I think sometimes we think about that and think about single stream as the push towards efficiency, and I think that's true. I think we have to find a balance between efficiency and quality, and whether or not single stream can find that balance. Um, I think there are a lot of, of pieces to that puzzle. I mean, I would definitely say I think um, we've employed a continuous process improvement philosophy mm -hmm. in how we run the MRF. So. To Lynn's point, it's not just when when you get pushback from markets about contamination, it's not just about slowing the line down. If you, you employ that philosophy, then you understand how all of the different factors interact. So, for example, I, I think we have to talk about single stream. We also have to talk about carts. One of the things that's interesting is that we converted to single stream and our primary customer at the time, the city of St. Paul, stayed in bins at the curb for about a year and a half or two years before transitioning to carts. So we definitely saw an increase in the residual rate going from dual stream to single stream, but then we saw even more of a jump going from bins to carts because the contamination is hidden in the cart much more easily than it had been at the curb. Um, the other thing that we have definitely seen and we're doing a lot of testing around this is around compaction. How much material you try to push into that truck has a real impact on how that material runs through facilities. So I think we have to pull all of those things apart because at the same time, when 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 cities, for example, the city of St. Paul went to carts, we did see an increase in participation. There was it is more convenient for folks, and so we have to balance all of those things. And I think we need to get a little more nuanced about how we ask some of these questions. Mm -hmm. um, a single stream is here. <laughs> it would be very you know. The people have been asking us, are you going to go back to dual stream? You know, I think there's a significant capital investment that would have to be made. Um, and, and the last thing that I'd say to that is, you know, the producers and the manufacturers have to engage in this conversation and they have to start investing in the capital requirements to meet the needs of the industry right now and to meet the changing stream. I think a really great example of, of that is cardboard. Most single stream facilities were designed in the 2000s. Um, you know, or, you know, ours was designed in 2013. We didn't have the degree of card, small cardboard boxes that we do now as a result of Amazon and home delivery. And so, you know, that's an, another few hundred thousand dollars that MRFs are going to have to invest to to adjust to that. MRFs and municipalities can't continue to hold that capital investment burden themselves we're going to have to start talking about manufacturers investing in that equipment to, to adjust to those needs. Um, 
So again, I don't think just saying single stream does or doesn't work is the question. It's about how do we make how do we make the investments that we need now, and how do we understand all the aspects of the system from collection all the way through processing? Mm -hmm. Right, um, and um, so before we go to closing remarks, um, by the way, friends, we have only ten minutes, um, so you know any comments or questions, this is the time. Um, so um, before going to the closing remarks and key messages. Um, uh, do, you, do you have any questions for Natalie Starr, who's the principal of DSM Environmental, or Amity Lumper, who, who's uh, a co-president of um, Cascadia Consulting? They'll be joining after you. And Nat, uh, Natalie has um, recently uh, uh, submitted a report to Central Ohio, um, to SWACO, um, where uh, DSM has looked at all kinds of recycling industries in the uh, region and try to understand what can be done next to improve local markets for recycling. And um, Amity has been working, um, uh, she'll be talking a lot about behavior change uh, and what's, what's been happening in the West Coast um, of the US. So do you have any questions for them, any thoughts? Mm. You said she'll be talking about behavior change? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated to listen. Um, I, we'll, prop, we'll, we'll throw some up on the group chat as we, <laughs> I'm sure we'll think of some as we listen. All right, awesome. So um, do you have any um, key messages that you would like to get out there um, that we haven't already covered? Hmm. I don't know. Um, I, I would just, I think I would reemphasize the last points we were just making, which is um, at this point when the industry is challenged, um, I do think it is really important that we start to to pull apart the complexity of this and don't just jump to a uh, recycling is broken or single stream doesn't work or mm -hmm. th there's a lot. And I, and I do think we have an opportunity with technology and other things right now to really understand better than we ever have before where the bottlenecks are, where the challenges are in the infrastructure and that can help guide investment. Um, so I, I would leave on that hopeful note. Um, right. <laughs> I think yeah. there is a lot of opportunity here um, I don't. I don't think we disagree with with Chaz and that like we do have to rethink the economic model here a little bit. Mm -hmm. the, the reality is it costs something to put trucks on the road and run a facility, and so how do we how we think about that and how that cost is shared throughout the supply chain is an important conversation. But coal raised a really interesting issue that we also obviously believe in that the externalities of waste, the costs of waste. You know, it, it's tempting to put waste, garbage, and recycling kind of in the same um, comparison because to a resident, the service looks the same. You put it in this cart and it gets collected, or that cart and it gets collected. But the cost to the community and the benefits to the community are extremely different. And and to Chaz's point, hard with the systems we have now to measure. Um, you know, but certainly the environmental justice aspects of waste, the health, and, you know, human and environmental health impacts are. Um, are, are nothing small. And so I think we need to get better at measuring those so we can get better at understanding um, and justifying maybe a shift in the economic model around recycling. And because it is, we, we do believe that there are challenges in the recycling industry, but there is the potential for recycling to be a real solid cornerstone for a circular economy, for a truly circular economy. But not every material, recycling isn't the answer for every material. You know, reduction of course has to be the the foundation, recycling can be a cornerstone in composting, and you know there's a lot of other solutions there. So I think um, not burdening recycling with the solving all the issues with our consumption, but it certainly has an important role to play. Oh. Just add one other thing, I mean, one thing to that, which is I think China and what's happened with National Sword has pulled the veil back, which needed to be pulled back, which is we were exporting our waste problem to somebody else, and that's the history of waste is that it's it's marginalized communities that have been the most impacted by waste. And we have to be thinking about those impacts as we redesign the system. Um, and then the second piece is I think it's really interesting to look at what's happening in Europe and requirements around recycled content, driving the manufacturers to engage in the industry in a very different way. Because if they're required to buy recycled content for the production of packaging, then they want to understand how to get good recycled content, and that drives it. And you know, I think that's some interesting, um, from a policy perspective, things for us to look at in the United States. 
Oh, that, that's great. Um, but now we've gotten a bunch of questions in the last one minute. Um, <laughs> so, um, well, the first question is from Avantika. She's asking, how does Eureka see themselves growing in the recycling market? That's number one. Number two is uh, Georgina. She says, um, Eureka seems to need extraordinary collaborative um, collaboration and relationship building skills for your success as well as long-term vision. Um, do you think that as women, you might have an advantage since these are typical competencies aligned uh, <laughs> with women in general, of course, uh, that's in general. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, and another question is, what is the first step you will do if you have to develop a local market in a country uh, in which most of the material is exported? So again, question one is, um, how, does, how do you see your growing and um, then question two is um, you know as women does that give you you know certain advantage and question three is what is the first step if you want to double I'll take the growth one yeah you want to take the growth one sure I mean you know we're we're um we're interested in in small sustainable growth you know we're, we're adding um, we're going after contracts for other small communities that make sense within our model that add efficiencies or um, kind of work within the, the model that we have. I think what, what we're really interested in growing is the, the influence that this model has. We're really um, looking now to figure out how to leverage this towards systems change on a bigger, you know, what do we have to offer, especially the industry in this kind of moment of existential crisis that we're in, you know, what does a mission driven, driven approach to recycling or a social enterprise approach to recycling um, have to offer, you know, how, how can this model influence some of the solutions as, as we rebuild or rethink how recycling works. Um, and then I, I think I think we get asked a lot, oh man, that must be so challenging to, to have co-leadership and you know who gets to the final decision and what if you know what if you want the final decision? And I think maybe it's because we're women, maybe it's because of our personality. I'm sure it's a combination, but I think we we find a lot more strength in that because we um, Kate and I operate, our brains operate very differently. And so we're really able to, to um, hold each other accountable and test our ideas. And I would much rather do it in collaboration than do it alone. Um, I, I mean, I think I'm sure there's some behavioral psychologists out there who would say that women are more prone to collaboration potentially, but I, I don't know that. And we have definitely had, you know, Eureka was founded by a man and a woman. Yep. Um, and have had male leadership here who also were very collaborative, collaborative and, and leaders in terms of building those collaborations with markets. And so I think that partially goes back to being a mission-based organization that's trying to balance profit with environmental benefit and social good. Mm -hmm. And when you're trying to balance those things, you inevitably, I think, have a more collaborative approach. Yeah. Because you have to. Um, so. Yeah, we'll let somebody study us to tell us how much of it's because we're women. <laughs> I'd rather not. <laughs> That's awesome. What was the third question? Oh, was the last question about if you don't have markets in your area? Well, what's the first step um, in building recycling markets? But um, I think we ran out of time, and I also yeah. think we um, covered that to an um, extent, uh, you know, in your in our conversation earlier, and um, talking about co um, collaborations. Um, I know that Georgina, uh, Georgina Nietzsche uh, from ISWA is um, listening in. So, um, hi, Georgina. Um, we've been uh, collaborating with the International Solid Waste Association to bring their you know, knowledge to uh, a larger audience in a much uh, easily accessible manner. And uh, this is, um, friends, this is something that Be Wastewise has done with uh, multiple organizations over the last five years. And um, so, yeah, if you have that kind of need, um, you know, contact us and then let's work together. Um, and um, with that, that's the end of our conversation with um, Kate Davenport and Lynn Hoffman. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We really yeah. enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Randy. Thanks. So I'll, I'll hide you from the broadcast now and then I'll bring Matthew Starr <laughs> and Andy Lumper um, onto the broadcast. So thank you so much.